Okay. These are the four precious words that every 10-year-old staying up too late longs to hear. Viewer discretion is advised. And in this specific case, what well, your parents were advised to not let you see, even though they could not help staring at it themselves, was this guy. Morton Downey Jr., talk show host. For a few years in the late 1980s, Morton Downey Jr. was the king of the syndicated talk show world. The Morton Downey Jr. show came barreling out of New York every night, headed straight for the national id. Morton Downey Jr. was the king of shock before America knew it wanted one of those. And he got just otherworldly guests. I mean, he got Joey Ramone, not sedated. He got uh, Kiss guitarist Ace Frehley without all the Kiss makeup on. He got professional wrestlers, real ones, fighting over race and workers' rights in debates that I, for one, believe were just as real as their fighting in the ring. Morton Downey Jr. even got Jerry Falwell, so you could watch on TV, live, the shock jock and the televangelist trying to outdo each other. It was like a snake eating its tail. Viewer discretion is advised. Sometimes, like when he needed to physically grab a wrestler for effect, Morton Downey Jr. would walk around his set empty-handed. But that was an exception, because most of the time in his studio, he carried a lit cigarette almost all the time. Smoking for him was almost existential. It was a fundamental, elemental part of him. To be Morton Downey Jr. was to stalk around on television with a cigarette, tapping the ash, staring down guests while the smoke drifted up past his ears. Morton Downey Jr. smoked his way through one conversation with Ron Paul back when Ron Paul was first running for president as a libertarian. In that interview, as in so many interviews, Morton Downey Jr. decided to yank Ron Paul's chain. Because the conversation was about the war on drugs, Downey called Ron Paul the man who could be snorting cocaine in the Oval Office. And that was just the opening. Let's join the program in progress. Viewer discretion is advised. You're giving libertarian a distorted uh, explanation. No, sir. You people gave it to yourselves in your platform. No, let me explain that. The answer is that we are allowed to do what we want. We even permit people to smoke cigarettes. Happen. That happens to be the most deadly drug in the United States today. Kills 320,000 people. I appreciate and maybe we ought to make I it illegal. I wish you'd ban it. I wish you'd ban it. Sure. If you would, then sir, you I'd put it out it in your eye the, right now. Can... I wish you would ban my cigarette so I could put it out in your eye right now. That was kind of the Morton Downey Jr. shtick. Well, in the early 1990s, Mr. Downey became a board member and spokesman for something called the National Smokers Alliance. It was not that big a leap, right? Fronting for the National Smokers Alliance, since Morton Downey Jr. was himself all but a synonym for smoking. But then Morton Downey Jr. got sick. Morton Downey Jr., former talk show host and lung cancer survivor, joins us this morning. Good morning, Morton. Good How morning. are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. It's Karen. great good to see you and in such good health. Uh, I've got to tell you, you look a lot better than Wally. <laughs> Well, thanks, Morton. I hope he's not watching. <laughs> so tell me, how are you feeling? I feel like a million bucks, thank God. Yeah, I, I feel great. It's uh, almost a year since I had uh, Has it been a year? my two lungs, uh, my two lobes on the right side excised, removed, taken out, mm-hmm. uh, gotten rid of. And uh, I'm hanging in there pretty good. It must have been such an ordeal. How did that change your life? You know, it changed it for the better. A, I don't smoke anymore, which uh, mm-hmm. I was a four to five pack a day smoker. Morton Downey Jr. eventually died of lung cancer, but not before he repented publicly for the smoking habit he used to glorify, for the smoking industry he used to represent. When a man named C. Everett Koop died last week, if you heard anything at all about his death and his legacy, you probably heard about his real heroism on the issue of smoking. Dr. Koop was appointed Surgeon General by President Ronald Reagan, and I think much to everybody's surprise, once he was in that position, he used that position to wage a war on smoking. He did a lot of other good besides, but at a time when the public was still arguing about whether smoking really was even all that bad for you, whether it was even worth warning people that smoking might be an unhealthful thing, C. Everett Koop, Surgeon in general, oftentimes in his full dress uniform, C. Everett Koop was unassailable. He was blunt as all get out, totally unequivocal and saying conclusively, yeah, smoking is bad for you. From his New York Times obituary, quote, Dr. Koop said he had begun campaigning against smoking after studying the research into its link to cancer, heart disease, stroke, and other diseases. He was dumbfounded, he said, and then plainly furious at the tobacco industry for attempting to obfuscate and trivialize this extraordinarily important public information. 
Surgeon General C. Everett Koop changed the national understanding and the national conversation about tobacco. Once he punctured the tobacco company's disinformation and denial on smoking being so bad for you, that put the focus on those companies for having hidden that information, for having covered up the fact that if you use their product as directed, it will hurt you. They knew that, and they kept that information from their customers. Facing that turn in the conversation, the companies tried to protect themselves. They tried to protect themselves by, in effect, creating a heat shield for themselves. themselves. A, a fake populist heat shield that was called the National Smokers Alliance. The idea was to keep the industry itself out of the news and out of the discussion. So it didn't just seem like a fight between one side that cared about your health and another side that wanted to make as much money as it could off of the process of killing you. So it wouldn't seem like it was the industry itself fighting the regulation of smoking and tobacco. The companies bankrolled this heat shield. They bankrolled this Morton Downey Jr. thing, this National Smokers Alliance. You can see the fine print there, right? Funded by Brown and Williamson cigarette sales. The National Smokers Alliance made sure that whenever a town someplace thought about maybe restricting smoking in restaurants and bars, officials in that town would suddenly get flooded with protest postcards. Stop the ban in Houston! Or stop the ban in Portland, Maine. Or stop the ban in Monongalia County, West Virginia. They, they all got the same identical cards, mass-produced for any place and every place overnight. Clearly trying to look local, right? <laughs> trying to look grassrootsy and not like something mass-produced by the tobacco industry, which of course they were. The National Smokers Alliance printed up these coasters that magically appeared in your corner bar so that while you were there drinking your beer, you could rest your beer on their tobacco industry message. Quote, you are being targeted. The prohibitionists want to prevent you from smoking here. If that was too scary, maybe you'd prefer to set your beer on this cute little coaster instead. Resist prohibition. See, here's that same image again. A little duck, see? On the so-called newsletter from the National Smokers Alliance. It's called The Resistance. The next year, the newsletter featured the launch of Feet on the Street, a nationwide grassroots effort designed to recruit new members. Grassroots, yeah, right. The local papers would soon report that this supposedly grassroots effort came with a bounty of 75 cents per head. The tobacco industry would pay to sign people up for their fake front organization that was supposed to look like a popular uprising of smokers getting together to defend their rights. The heat shield was phony. It was obviously phony. It was dreamed up by the PR firm Burson Marsteller. It was not a real grassroots thing. Big Tobacco tried to use it, but they were not good at it. And maybe it would have gone better if their spokespeople had not trotted out the exact same sound bites everywhere they tried to stop smoking bans. Lines like, accommodation and common courtesy can solve this problem. When you say that same awkward and weirdly composed thing exactly the same way in all sorts of different places all around the country, it's clear to everybody that you're not a local effort. You're reading from some mass-produced script. What Big Tobacco was up to was transparent almost from the start. They weren't good at it. They did not get their money's worth from Burson Marsteller. Quoting the LA Times in 1998, behind the fuming bar owners is a highly sophisticated public relations campaign, much of it orchestrated by a tobacco industry-backed group based in Virginia called the National Smokers Alliance. Assisting that group is one of the world's largest PR firms, Burson Marsteller. Right? This is the way it was being reported at the time they thought they were duping everybody. It was Bad. They were bad at it. They were busted. Their fake, their fake grassroots were showing. It did not help Big Tobacco that reputable officials like C. Everett Koop were being so relentlessly credible and confrontational on the subject, even in the face of tons of opposition from, say, tobacco state senators. It did not help them that Morton Downey Jr., their chosen spokesman, smoked his way to lung cancer and then publicly repented about it. But they also just did not do a good enough job with this fake populist heat shield strategy of theirs, and it failed. And, and this is how you can tell it failed. Pursuant to being hounded in the courts, to being sued for selling a product that, when used as directed, can kill you, the chief executives of the nation's tobacco companies got hauled into Congress to get asked the miserable questions they had sought for so long to avoid. The industry wanted to stay out of the debate. They paid to invent a whole fake smokers' rights group to debate in public so they wouldn't have to. But it didn't work. They couldn't get away from the lawsuits, so they couldn't get away from Congress, so they couldn't get away from the public. They could not hide. Welcome to the spotlight of accountability. It's hot, isn't it? Things went so badly for big tobacco that the industry ultimately got forced into a multi-billion dollar settlement that required them to pay for ads against their own products. Like this one showing piles of body bags outside a tobacco company. 
Or this one, where a real Marlboro man comes riding into New York City and he is not looking so hot. The tobacco industry's heat shield did not work. Do you want to see what it looks like when it does work? That's next. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. We do not give up. Expect surprises. Subscribe.